Sodium ion batteries are coming. They're going to change the world. They're so amazing. Okay, are all the clickbait people in? Good. Let's get to the reality. I got Jordan Gisagi here. We're going to talk about what the reality is of the sodium batteries, debunk a couple of the most popular and prevalent myths, and explain what's really going on. I'm Brian. Welcome to Futuraza. Oh, 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 oh. Jordan, you had a fantastic video recently that I wanted to get into. I'm going to show first that, uh, did you know that Cyberfest and Furious is coming? I will be there. Uh, Showtime Speedway in Clearwater, Florida in November. That's just the week after I'm going to be in Texas for the shareholder meeting. That's a lot of fun. Join us, won't you? Uh, guys, uh, Jordan Gieseke has this uh, channel here called The Limiting Factor, where he covers all kinds of cool stuff. And what we're talking about today is his sodium uh, battery uh, technical review. So, uh, getting right into it, I will say that, uh, I was also planning on doing a sodium battery, uh, video, but I wasn't going to get down to the molecular level. So I, so you did a fantastic, uh, summary of the sodium ion battery. I was going to do one myself. I don't think I was going to get down to the molecular level. So I'm happy to, uh, just point people to yours instead. There will be a link in the description. So when we're talking, I assume you've seen comments on your videos, comments on X comments everywhere saying, why aren't we talking more? about sodium. Don't you know how it's going to save the world and be everything to everyone instantly? There's some reality to that. Uh, let's talk first about the basic, what are the basic advantages that are, that are real? Well, there's a number of them. And this is one, uh, a good critique that people out of the video, they, they said you didn't go into all these other things, but from my perspective, the, the primary advantage of a, a sodium ion battery is the cost and its charge and discharge rates due to its lower inherent ionic conductivity. Mm -hmm. so those are the two primary uh, um, advantages that they have. Uh, it, go yeah. Ahead. Oh, it's abundant materials. Mm -hmm. And we've I've got a section from your video I can show on that. But yeah, and, and that's that's important to point out is the the cost. The reason why they're so cheap and going to get cheaper is because the materials that go into them are so dirt cheap and uh, um they're already massively scaled at a global level and they're only going to continue to scale over time so the 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 scale and cost are linked so it's if you separate those out it's actually three really solid benefits so looking at this here this is what you might expect to find and guy by the way guys you can like jordan's video like i did it's it's free he doesn't charge to like it and uh, uh that's just just do that and please when you're done watch Watch his video. So we're looking here, nickel, uh, you know, copper, lithium, graphite, all expensive materials. And then as we get into sodium, it is all of the cheaper materials. So that is an advantage. Um, the charging speed is better because as you said, the lithium is a bit slipperier. I think it shows pretty, you had a, well, it's probably the best way to put it, the way that Shirley Mung put it is all the materials are more fluffy. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> because like um, the way that sodium form, forms bonds within the cathode, for example, is that it's uh, there's just a bit more space. There, there's more space between all the ions so they can s slide in and out of the cathode structure um, more easily. And then when they get to the... Uh, to the electrolyte, uh, the electrolyte is kind of less sticky is probably the best way to put it. So they can flow through easier. And mm -hmm. then when you get to the anode, it depends on how you, which chemical or which structure that you use for the anode, but it can be very low ionic resistance as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, unfortunately, one of the things you brought up in your video was there's the biggest claim of all is not that the minerals are cheaper. That's pretty straightforward. We get that. Uh, it's that therefore the packs themselves will be 90% cheaper. You have to use very precise equipment. The equipment is a lot of the cost. The factory, the factory isn't cheaper uh, just because, you know, these are high precision materials. Uh, equipment that you're using to make a uh, very uh, specific, very uh, rigorously tested stuff. Is the equipment going to get cheaper? Well, it's uh, it's probably good uh, worth teasing a few things out there. You can 
produce sodium ion batteries drop in with the currently currently the equipment that we use to produce LFP battery cells. And everybody thinks, oh, that's end of the story, problem solved. But <laughs> they're forgetting that the uh, uh, cell factory is just the tip of the iceberg. That's like five to 10% of like the, the total effort uh, that it takes to build a supply chain for batteries. Like for instance, if you're just looking at um, the cathode material, the production of the cathode material, they've spent 15 or 20 years refining the recipe to bake that cathode and to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to produce high yields and uh, a high energy density product. So it, it's not something that just happens overnight. Um, just, you know, as I said, focusing on the cathode, it takes them a while to make recipes that are amenable to manufacturing and that's a 5 10 15 year process so even though the materials for sodium ion are pretty cheap at the moment and they're going to get much cheaper um the the finished products that go into the cell they're still relatively expensive more expensive than lfp mm -hmm. so uh, then we've got a another thing you brought up in your video was that that 90 percent reduction in cost I don't know where it came from. I've looked. I have also looked. I have also not found it. And if you go to CATL's site, uh, it's not there. That's not where it comes from. So if I tell you company XYZ has this breakthrough battery that's going to do all these things, I imagine you're fairly skeptical. But if CATL or BYD or Panasonic announces something, how much faith do you have in it? They always use, so this is going to sound like a put down, but they always use weasel words. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. use, they use word, the safe PR words that have been vetted by the legal department and the marketing team. It's like, ah, oh, what can we say that is true, but also is not the complete truth. So they give you, <laughs> they give you the, the shiny part of things. It's, it's kind of a gilded, um, a gilded information that they give you. Uh, so it's, uh, it looks and sounds good, but, but as soon as you start digging into it, it's not as impressive. So it's not what they're saying is false. It's what they, they've just given you a very one-sided perspective on things. Mm -hmm. And if we look at CATL's uh, press release, it, it is well couched. Did I just click something? No. Um, it is well couched. They are telling you with certainty that, you know, here's some of the charge things that we that it can do that make it better. And other other safety factors they don't burn that's great uh that's not surprising i think i think that's been known for some time well here's the thing it's 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 a degree better of safety and this is one of the in my comments something that a lot of people brought up and they're like well sodium ion it, it's impossible for it to to catch on fire it's like no it's less likely to catch on yeah. fire. And, and it's not actually a selling point because right now they already have lithium ion battery cells to the point where the error rate is one part per billion. And so what you're talking about is the number of defective battery packs, even if every vehicle that we made in the world was uh, uh, with uh, you know batteries, you'd only have like 10 to 100 um, defective packs in the entire world. And then in terms of going a, a level lower than that, there's the number that are defective and then there's the number that catch on fire, which is, is even a fraction of that. So we mm -hmm. already have lithium ion sa safety solved to the point where it's good enough for the manufacturers. For example, um, roughly 10,000 car crashes per year are ca caused just by the wheels falling off. <laughs> so, huh. so huh. It, yeah. You would think that technology would be sorted out by now. Yeah. Do you have a torque wrench? Yep. So the bat it's a non-issue, the safety of lithium ion batteries now. It's something, mm -hmm. yeah, we should absolutely do everything that we can to save lives. But it's not a selling point for sodium ion to the point where manufacturers would be willing to switch to them just for that. Right. And LFP batteries themselves have gotten very fire resistant. Uh, and there's a new standard coming, I think, in the next few months or maybe six months in China that sets even higher standards on uh, fire resistance. Fire as a EV issue is, I think we will agree, dramatically overblown. Um, it is not very common. It was a it was a, a fair uh, criticism a decade ago, but um, it stopped being that about w within the past five years. And now with these new standards and improved pack safety, it's 
Yeah, it's a non-issue. I was saying to Sandy Monroe that something can't burn. And he said, oh, it can burn. G- give me enough temperature. I'll burn a rock. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can vaporize a rock. Sure. I mean, that's what happens to meteors all the time. And anything that stores energy inherently has the potential to, uh, to an increased potential beyond a rock to burn. So uh, I 100% agree with your point. And I'm just reinforcing that uh, this idea that there's a perfectly safe battery out there, it's never going to happen. The other misconception I saw, and I've seen a lot is, well, these are, you know, these are going to be cheap, Jordan. They use salt. They don't use salt. They don't use table salt. What do they use? Uh, They use sodium carbonate, which is... uh... Well, that's bubbly salt water. I can drink that. (laughs) Yeah, so it's it's just made from uh, I think it's trona is the ore that it comes from, but it's soda ash and yeah, so there's still huge amounts of that out there. But it's just um, when people say that, it becomes immediately apparent that they haven't really looked into it at, at all. When they say use it, for, they run on table salt. It's like okay, yeah. yeah. You're close, <laughs> but right. it would have taken uh, two minutes of research to look into that. And would you say that that's comparable to how not all lithium is created the same? You want a uh, spodamine or what? spodamine? Yeah. Spodamine. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with lithium, it's not any lithium you want. It's certain kinds. This is the same, but sodium is sodium carbonate is easier to find than than. Well, what it comes down to is this the battery uses sodium carbonate as its primary chemical because when they uh when they make the electrolyte solution or when they make the cathode it's just there's certain chemicals that are easier to use you could use sodium chloride which is table salt but then this the cost would go through the roof because you'd have to convert that sodium chloride to other things uh, mm-hmm. So you, you want to use the the specific chemical that facilitates all those manufacturing processes the best, or that can be directly used in the battery. Right. Uh, less refining steps if you start with the correct thing, with the right ore. And yeah, I'm sure you could start with seawater. It's just going to be a lot more steps. And if it was like a wartime effort, and that's the only thing that nation had for an electrolyte, go for it, I guess. But not the ideal solution. Um, one of the things you covered was the uh, was the energy density, uh, both gravimetric and volumetric. Those are improving. Um, CATL saying that they could already be at 175 watt hours per kilogram, I think it was. Correct. And that is uh, quite reasonable. That puts it on par with, you know, LFP, depending on the LFP cell. 175 watt hours per kilogram. How important is this for automotive use? Well, there's always this ongoing debate over watt hours per kilogram and gravimetric energy density. And what it comes down to is which one of those things is limiting the range of the vehicle. And it really, it really depends. Like if you have super high gravimetric energy density, then, uh, and you have something with low volumetric energy density, that's what's going to limit the amount of batteries that you can put in the vehicle and therefore your range. Um, yeah. And then the inverse can also be true. So what's the limiting factor? So, <laughs> it really, so you want to use the right metric. He said thing. it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you want to use the, uh, the metric that's most relevant. So you can, you can't just like fixate on one thing. So we, we have the gravimetric and volumetric energy density of lithium ion battery cells to the point where, you know, they're great. So we can, you know, we could stop now and just start focusing on reducing the cost. Um, or continue focusing on reducing the cost. Whereas for sodium ion batteries, it's a different story. The gravimetric energy density, it's good enough to where it's it's not going to hurt the range of the vehicle by virtue of being too heavy and creating too much, um, you know, being hard too hard to haul around. But the problem with it is uh, the volumetric energy density is low, so there's only so many that you can fit under the vehicle unless you're willing to eat into the cabin space and m- like make a thicker floor, for example. So sodium ion batteries are probably around, um, at best, uh, 
Uh, their volumetric energy density is about 20% worse than lithium ion batteries, but more like 30%. And this is what I've seen in some of the production vehicles that they have coming out is you can have the LFP pack or you can have the sodium ion pack with 30% less range because that's all the cells we can fit into it. Yes. And when you say, well, I'll tell you that there is no limit to how much you can cut into the cabin space. At least that's what GM said when they built the Hummer, because I don't know if you've seen that pack, but it is a foot thick it is uh it, that battery pack does way more than a honda civic i'm not exaggerating uh so that's silly um, we have seen i assume you have seen as well uh, sodium battery vehicles deployed in china there are a number of them they've actually had them for a few years they're uh the range is shorter they're city cars um but if you need a city car who cares yeah. And th this is another critique of the video. People were saying, well, the sodium ion batteries have been around for years. And I'm like, I, I didn't discuss that at all. The, the key point that I had in the video is it's going to take a while before they get to scale. We, we had LFP battery packs 15 years ago, but we really like Tesla didn't start using them in their vehicles until five years ago. So it was a decade there before they started being used in, in large quantities. And this it's same is likely going to be with sodium ion. You'll see them in all sorts of products, but not the products that most of us are going to be using. That is absolutely true. And especially in the U.S., we are kind of far from everything all the time. Uh, we don't have the kind of urban density you'll see in Europe and parts of Asia that allow for us to have city cars. And I've seen people say, well, I just need 100 miles. I know, but they make those cars and no one buys them. So while it might be the right for your use case, you still didn't buy one. Uh, that's going to limit the market size. Um, guys, Jordan and I could talk for days, but we're going to do a two-parter on this because the next thing I want to talk about is sodium for stationary energy, which is a big deal. And we've got a bunch of other sodium loose ends to tie up. And I do want to give him incredible credit for one of the jokes he made in his video that just slipped by so quick you'd miss it if you, if you weren't paying attention, but I was. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, or rather, probably tomorrow. Uh, guys, head over to the Limiting Factor. Find out what Jordan's up to. It is the go-to place for batteries. It is so good that when I had questions for the 4680 engineer at a Tesla event, she, of course, wouldn't answer me, but she would just say, uh, go check out the Limiting Factor because he's got it dialed in which is huge. Uh, guys in the comments, what do we miss? What do we misunderstand? Come back tomorrow for part two. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots, you know, tomorrow. <laughs>